Today, I spoke with Rhonda, who shares her story about her brother's tragic passing as a result of his gambling disorder. This podcast contains sensitive and triggering events, but the story really does make an impact, and I want you to take away just how powerful it is that someone that's been impacted in their life so tragically still works so hard to help others who are going through the exact same situation. Welcome to the first episode of the ODAT Recovery Podcast. Today, my guest is Rhonda Hadafi, and she's going to be sharing the story of her brother that she tragically lost due to his gambling disorder. Rhonda, welcome. How are you doing today? Thank you. I'm doing well. So before we jump into everything, where are you from and what do you do today? I'm from Eugene, Oregon. It's where I, I was born and raised, grew up. And I am a preschool teacher um, for money. That's my job. <laughs> and I do um, awareness for gambling prevention, suicide prevention, and mental health and wellness. Thank you for sharing that. Let's let's let everyone know kind of the backstory here. Why do you work to spread awareness about gambling and about suicide prevention? I am one of five kids in our family, and I'm the youngest. My brother Bobby is just a year older than I am, and uh, we grew up together. We um, went to school in the same class all the way through elementary school, all the way through high school. Um, he moved to Portland, probably like 1988, he moved to Portland and, um, started a job there working in a steel mill and, uh, his hours were odd. And so he got off work at one o'clock in the morning. So when, uh, gambling started with scratch tickets and Kino, he would do that a little bit to unwind. But in 1992, video poker came in and he started going to a bowling alley to unwind before work. And he um, started playing more than he should have and became addicted to that. Um, so it was just a few short years later that he ended his life. What for? Let's take one step back for those that don't know. What is video poker? In Oregon, we have video lottery terminals. Those video lottery terminals can play uh, poker, they can play slots, they can play um, just some different games. Um, and video poker was Bobby's game of choice. So this was back in the 90s then, kind of before the machines got super technologically advanced like they are today. But what were like the mm -hmm. actual limits on the machines? Was it kind of controlled in any way? Was it lower stakes or were people able to kind of put a lot of money into these things? That's a really good question. When Bobby started gambling, I had to have dollar bills to go into the machine. They all are supposed to have a $200 limit, but that's per machine. And each establishment at that time had five machines. So mm -hmm. it's not monitored. And in Oregon, we have, um, unfortunately, um, we have an Oregon lottery that is a commission that's in charge. Our police really are not in charge of any of that. So the only people who would be monitoring that money that would go in would be the people that were collecting it on the other end. So it didn't really happen. Okay. So Bobby was going and he was playing on these machines after work. Did you, as his sister, like, could you tell when things were starting to progress or was he kind of hiding the severity of things as it was going? We as a family knew that Bobby was gambling and he shared very little with us about um, the extent of his gambling. Um, but we did know that he was coming to us to borrow money, of course, lying to us and telling us it was for gas or food or whatever. Um, but when we caught on that each of us were being asked for $20, we kind of realized what was going on. We questioned him about it. He talked to me about it. And he said, it's not, I just go just to go. It's not really fun. It's not something I enjoy. It's just something I do. Um, so yes, we did know that he was gambling. We did not know at that time that it was considered an addiction. We just thought he had a lack of impulse control. What was he like before he started going and playing on those machines versus after? Ooh, good question. Um, I don't think I've ever been asked that question. Um, so we are a very tight knit family. And so we are together all the time. 
Um, Bobby was always a part of that. He started at a very young age working and raising money, whether it be walking dogs or pulling weeds or delivering newspapers, whatever it was. Um, Bobby was always the one that was earning money and he enjoyed giving that money or spending that money on other people. He's the one out of the five kids that every Christmas he had something under the tree from him to us. Um, you know, nothing big, nothing major as a child, but he always had something there. So he was a very generous, loving, big part of our family. He's an outdoorsman. He loved to be hunting and fishing and, um, you know, just, just being camping outside. He just, he loved being outside. Um, so that was a big part of us growing up that, that he continued in his adult life. So he was involved with the, with his nieces and nephews and just a fun loving part of our family. After he started gambling, um, we noticed him pulling away. We noticed um, he was not at family functions anymore. Um, we had asked him about it and he said, I can't afford to bring anything, so why bother? So that really bothered him that he didn't have the money to contribute anymore. Um, he would come sometimes to family things, but it wouldn't be long before he would excuse himself to go get a Mountain Dew at the store or to go run an errand, um, and then we wouldn't see him again. So it definitely pulled him away from us the way we had been used to. And when he was going to gamble, was he, if you ever had this conversation with him, was he seeking to avoid anything or was he experience anything or was he just going because that's what he became accustomed to doing? Like what was the driving motivation for getting started? Um, you know, for as far as I know, in the beginning, it was just like I said, he, he got off work at one in the morning. He was living with my parents for a while when he moved back up to Portland and um, they were all in bed. So he would just go just to get away from, just to unwind after work. And then he would come home and, and go to bed. And um, so that's how it started. Once the video poker came in and that kind of took control of him, it was whenever he had a moment he was gambling and I, his words to my mom was that I don't enjoy it. It's not fun. I don't like doing it. It's something I have to do. So I think at that point it was so in his, it changed his brain to the point of just needing it, not being able to escape that desire. For the people in the audience that don't fully maybe understand gambling disorder, it sounds a lot like, you know, the people who might go and have one glass of wine at night in the beginning and then have it progress to be something where you're drinking because you physically depend on the feeling that it gives you. So it's very comparable for those that might not understand right away. Now, getting back to the timeline here with Bobby, we're at the point now where he's pulling away socially, he's pulling away from the family. Is there a point that things really seemed to hit a so-called bottom? along the way? Um, so for Bobby, um, there were a couple of things that I think really struck him hard that we had talked about. One was that um, just a couple of months before he passed, he was passed up for a job at work that he felt he was highly qualified for. He thought it was should have been his position to be promoted up to. Um, he was really angry about that and frustrated. Um, and the direct reason was, was he, his dependability um, and his work ethic had dropped in, re in recent months um, was the reason that they had given him. So that was number one. Um, number two is he had borrowed money from my parents. He was paying them back and he had already spent his paycheck. He um, went to my mom on Mother's Day, so it, May 10th, and said, um, I, I don't have the money. I don't know what to do. I am gambling and I don't enjoy it. It's not fun. I don't want to do it. I just do it. He had cut up all of his credit cards and he said, the state is telling me this is this should be fun and entertainment, but that's not what it is for me. It, my, I can't shut my brain off. And at that point, he wasn't eating well. He wasn't sleeping well. 
Um, he wasn't functioning at work well. And so my mom called and got an appointment with a counselor. And so he had, he started counseling shortly after, um, but they ad admitted they didn't know how to treat a camp as someone who was gambling. So they just treated him as a depressed person. They gave him some Prozac and sent him home and told him, just go do things you enjoy doing. Um, <clears throat> that is, a, he had, I think, three visits is all with that counselor before she dismissed him. Um, so that was you know, early May. So G July came along. It's my dad's birthday, July 4th. We all went camping. Bobby joined us on our camping trip. We were all excited for that. Um, Bobby took enough food and a tent, a huge tent, uh, that we could have slept in with him, um, even though we were all supposed to bring our own. Um, and we had what we thought an exciting time to get Bobby back because we thought he's admitted he has a problem. He's in counseling. They give him some medicine. We're going to get Bobby back. So we all, there was like 30 of us. They went camping, super excited about it. Um, looking at the pictures now, he wasn't really with us. I think his decision had already been made. But um, we did go hiking and played baseball and went fishing and sat around the campfire and did all the things that you do when you camp. Um, that was July 4th and 5th. Um, I didn't see Bobby again until I was ready to surprise him at his company picnic um, on July 22nd. Um, and so in that time span, um, again, Bobby had not paid his truck payment. He had not, um, paid my parents back that he was trying to get that money for. Um, he had already spent his paycheck. And so he, I think that was that downfall for him was all of that thing coming together. Um, like I said, knowing that he felt like there was no control, like he had no control over it. it. It wasn't fun. And he just had lost all of it at that point. Looking at the situation playing out, I, I don't imagine that that's how things would go in today's day and age in terms of the medical professional side. But did there seem to be like an expectation that he should kind of like just stop? Was that mm -hmm. something that doctors were kind of puzzled at at the time? Absolutely. Um, that's exactly what they told us was that um, I was able to meet with his uh, counselor that we had at the time. And she said exactly that. She said, I don't gamble. I don't understand this. Um, my mom had went in with him to his appointment and told the counselor that he was gambling, that he was unable to stop on his own, kind of went through all of the things that he had done, like stopped uh, or cut up all of his credit card, finding other interests like he was told to do. Um, so she kind of went through those things with them. And the counselor was like, that's all I got. I don't I don't know what else to do with them. Um, so treating him as depressed was the best she thought she could do. I hope that any, uh, you know, treatment providers, counselors that end up watching this take note of just how far we've come and hopefully use it as inspiration to keep going because there's still a lot of questions to be answered today, but that's just heartbreaking to hear. When Bobby, my mom had also told the counselor that Bobby was suicidal and that he had um, contemplated even taking out people at work because he was so angry of not getting that. Um, promotion. So his emotions were all over the place. And so she gave him Prozac and never monitored it. And so if there's anything else that goes along with this, talking to the counselors and talking to people, it is so important that those meds are monitored. We found bottles and bottles of meds at his house that he did not take, that they he didn't like the way they made him feel. Um, he didn't feel like he was safe at work with them. Now, this kind of leads us right up to the phone call, does it not? I was newly married and had a young family. We were going to surprise Bobby at his company picnic. So um, we were getting ready, hurry in the morning just so that we could get up there. We were all super excited to get up and surprise him at his picnic. Mm -hmm. And the phone rang. Um, the phone call was from my brother, EJ, who lived in Portland as well, um, near my parents. And um, he 
I answered the phone and he just said, I need to talk to Darren, who's my husband. I knew at that moment that Bobby was gone. And I don't know why I knew that because I didn't know Bobby was suicidal. My mom's the only one who knew that in the beginning, but I screamed so loud that our neighbors heard me. And I only know that because my daughter wrote that in as a freshman in high school, she had to write about an unforgettable me memory. And that is her memory. Um, I don't remember much after that. Um, we went to my sister's house. I have a sister and brother who live here in Eugene as well. And we all kind of carpooled up to my parents' house together. Um, I don't remember anything about that um, other than just I kept opening the Bible and just reading whatever I could find um, out loud which is I get extremely car sick. So the fact that I could do that is shocking, but I did. Seeing my parents in their driveway, they were just standing there waiting for us. And just seeing them in the driveway is something I'll never forget. The look on their faces. Um, my dad actually found Bobby uh, with my two nephews, they were teenagers and they were spending a couple weeks in Portland and they rode their bikes to his house because he hadn't answered his phone. And um, that's, that's how he was found. And so just having all of them there waiting for us. Um, my mom is, was strong from the beginning. She said, I just need needed to know that you guys were okay. They were just heart wrenched at us driving with the information that we had. I just needed to hug them. So the next few days are just a big blur of stuff happening. Um, lots of different things going on, like I said, my sister's two boys, two oldest boys were with my parents. Um, so my sister's attention had to go to them. Um, my brother who lived there, his kids were in New York with their mom. Um, and so he was struggling on that as well. And then having an 18 month old, like I, I don't, I had to be responsible for my kids um, in a time when I didn't, I didn't know what to do. Well, thank you for sharing that. And, you know, sorry for your loss. I'm sure that anyone that's listening to this or watching this is probably feeling those same emotions that you're feeling right now, though. I don't know how many can relate to them. So it's very, very difficult situation. With that being said, with a situation so potent and so intense and raw, why do you still try to make a difference for others who might be going through it. Why not? Some people might be thinking run away and forget that it ever happened and push it down. Why do you do the work that you do now? I needed to understand why, what happened. Uh, my mom wrote on his death certificate, suicide thanks to the Oregon state lottery. Um, they couldn't print it that way. And so a newspaper asked, called and asked the Oregonian, called and asked if they could come and do an article to figure out why we would say that. Um, when that came out, uh, we, we, there were two phone calls um, that happened. One was a gentleman who um, was in Eugene and planning to end his life that day. He had got everything in place for that to happen. And his mom saw the article and called and interrupted his plan. Had him come over and had him call us. Um, I'm still good friends with them today. The mom and dad have since passed, but um, I'm still really good friends with the gentleman who um, was going to do that. Seeing that, that 
he, for the same exact reason that we had. And I thought, how crazy that we have someone like that this close to us that is experiencing the same thing. Um, there was another phone call of a gentleman who um, left a message on my parents' machine and said, Bobby's right. That's the only way to get away from this addiction is death. There's nothing else to do. And he was actually arrested trying to jump off a bridge in Portland. So seeing that those two people related so quickly to our story made me want to know more. I didn't know gambling was an addiction. I mean, we were told that it was entertainment. We've been told the whole time it's been here that this is fun and enjoyable and it helps our state do good things. And that's what we believed until Bobby. So those two reasons are one. Um, and then I got back to Eugene and I um, made a phone call and asked if I could please come into a meeting. We had some um, meetings here going on by a group called Emergence and it was ACEs back then, but Emergence is now. And I uh, sat in that meeting and I was allowed into the meeting as long as I would tell our side of the story and listen to everybody else. But I was, I, you know, I couldn't comment on anything, of course. I sat in that meeting and one of the ladies in that meeting spoke words that Bobby had written in his suicide note. And between the two phone calls and that one comment, I knew that if we didn't know what was happening, there were other people who didn't know what was happening as well. So that's when I got my drive to know better, to learn about it, and to try to protect other people. And honestly, one of my biggest goals when I started was to make sure Bobby was never forgotten. Bobby was so important to me and in my family that it was heart-wrenching to think that he could just be erased, like just be gone and nobody talk about it again. And I didn't want people to think of him as a bad person. I wanted people to know all the good that he did for our family and in our lives and in our community. So he passed away July 20th. We found him July 22nd. Um, his birthday is September 29th. So in my processing and trying to figure things out, I decided I needed to do a problem gambling awareness day. I needed other people to know that gambling could become a problem. I started making phone calls. I looked for a place to just set up a banner. I made a thousand copies of a flyer that I created. Um, and I just knew people were going to want to hear this. Like I just knew people were going to be like, yes, this is finally someone who understands. Quite the opposite happened. We were laughed at, we were mocked, we were told absolutely no way could we use space of any of our malls, our parking lots. Like we just were going to set up in the parking lot of a mall and nobody. And we were just, people told us gambling isn't a problem. People are the problem. There's not, there's, I mean, nobody thought anything of it. It was his fault. He chose, he made a choice. He spent his money. So we were, I mean, it was, it was pretty brutal the first year. Um, I took a picture and I'll send it to you. My parents decided to take an ad out in the book that we're going in, um, where his obituary ran and it's little, it's like this big, and it was over $300 to get it in. And it said, first annual problem gambling awareness day um, in loving memory of Bobby. That just felt like something people would see and maybe give a second thought to like, why, why is that? We had one person, one reporter come out to our problem gambling awareness day. We ended up doing it in my sister's driveway. We brought my parents RV down. We made big signs. We wrote on balloons like we just did it the best we could. Um, and we had one reporter and he said, honestly, I'm out of just pure um, just to figure out what you guys are doing. Like none of this makes sense to me. This is kind of a ridiculous thing. But the curiosity got me. I'm here. Like, what is this about? So we got one reporter to 
do a little report about it. But I just wasn't willing to give that up. I wasn't willing to just go past that. I just felt like mm -hmm. we were being called to, to share this story, even though mm -hmm. we were told with him being, you know, ending his life by suicide, we should be ashamed. We should be embarrassed. Even in my church that I had been a part of for years, they just said, you know, let's just hope he asked God into his heart before he did it because it's he's going to hell. It's a sin. That was the comment. Like nobody wanted to hear that side of it. And I just felt so strongly that we couldn't be the only ones who needed this information. Um, I did connect with that family that I told you about, Eugene. They got us a speaking engagement um, at the coast an hour away. We got a call from a TV news station in Seattle. They took us there on the train and had us tell our story. Maury Povich called and asked if he could do a story. So, I mean, people kept asking for it, just not local people. And so we did end up um, just continuing to share it. And the more I shared it, the more I learned that People needed to hear it. Um, I've got hundreds and hundreds of calls from people across the United States saying, I just need someone who will listen. I just need someone who might understand where I'm going through. Will you please talk to my spouse? They don't think this is real. Like so many times. And um, I'm passionate about this that, you know, Bobby's death wasn't in vain. There's a reason that. Um, I'm the one that took this on, that he, he passed, and I'm the one who took this on. I'm not willing to be ashamed and embarrassed. That's what took Bobby away from me, and I'm not willing to be a part of that. So, I mean, here and a half years later, and I'm still just as passionate about it. I still feel like the word needs to get out there no matter, no matter what. I mean, I'm proud of you, and, you know, I understand the exact feeling of being ridiculed for coming out and saying something like this because half the comments that I receive online and likely half that will get on this video just don't seem to view problem gambling in the same light as other dependencies. I mm -hmm. think that we can probably say across the board right now that people view alcoholism as a real problem. I don't think that anyone can look you in the eyes and tell you that they don't think that some people struggle with alcohol dependency. Mm -hmm. But right now, they'll still put the blame on the problem gambler. And the mm -hmm. messaging that we see on advertisements that say, call us if you have a problem, kind of reinforces that as well. Mm -hmm. So moving into tangible next steps, if you could change something about the way that gambling and problem gambling is viewed today, do you know what it would be? Well, there's a few things that I think need to happen. Um, I think number one, we need to make sure that um, people's voices are heard and that they're not silenced. So I think both sides of the story need to be told. And I think both sides of the story need to be um, put out in commercials and in, you know, we see this, the commercials right now for cigarettes and people with cancer. Um, the same thing needs to happen for gambling. My message from day one has always been, there is help and there is hope. I have never said, you will die if you gamble. People can drink socially and be okay. Other people cannot. Gambling is just no different. We need to show both sides of that story. We need to be allowing those voices to be heard. And I think we're doing a really good job with that right now. Um, in some aspects, there are some podcasts that are out there now, like you said, there's different things happening that are showing. I would like to see that more. I have um, Take a Break campaign that we have started. We've done it for about 15 years. Take a step back and evaluate. It's a time for a conversation. The shame and the guilt are what took my brother from me. The money is a side factor. I could not even tell you how much money he spent. I have no idea. I don't know what his credit card bills were. I don't know how much he borrowed. I don't know how much thing, how many things he sold for money. But what I do know
being said, we need to be able to speak about it without feeling that shame and guilt. There's so much stigma around it. People who work in big businesses can't come forward and say that they have a gambling addiction because then all eyes are on them. There's embezzlements. We know that they lie. We know that they cheat. We know that they steal. We know this, these things, not because they're bad people, but because of what this addiction has led them to. But that makes them, it makes it hard for them to be able to speak freely and to say that there is a problem. So we need to find a way to fix that. That would be my number one. I also feel like the industry needs to take some more responsibility. We cannot continue to ask someone who struggles with a gambling addiction to make a good choice. We would never put drugs in front of a drug addict or alcohol in front of an alcoholic and say, it's right there in front of you. Let me know if you have a problem with that. Having the accessibility that we do of lottery from state sponsored lottery to casinos, to scratchets, to kino, to poker rooms, to what online now, sports betting. I mean, you name it, it's in front of them all the time. We need to find mm -hmm. a way to make that so that it's not, not fully on them. And we need to um, continue to educate families and um, communities about what it looks like. Because you know as well as anybody, it's a hidden disease in so many ways that um, if we don't talk about it with people and start conversations, then we're not going to make a difference. We have to be able to get it out in the open. If someone that's watching this is recognizing some signs from Bobby's story that maybe their partner, their mother, their brother, their sister is withdrawing from the family, they're seeming to sneak off at random times to go and buy something at the store. If they're seeing some of these signs, what should they do? I think the most important thing that to do, again, um, I sound like a broken record, but we need to start the conversation. We have to start the conversation. And I think being okay with the response, and I'm going to tell you, that's the hardest thing because we don't, it's hard to say without judgment, I, I am here for you. I will help you. Let me, you know, you, you have to be willing to go both ways. It has the conversation has to be two sided, of course, but it's hard when somebody tells you, I've lied to you. I've stolen from you. I've, you, we have nothing left in our bank. Um, please still support me and love me. It's hard. And I get that. But if we don't have that conversation, um, then it, then it's we're not going to go anywhere either. So number one is have the conversation. Number two is protect yourself. If you're worried that you know a, a significant other is gambling. Make sure that you are taking care of yourself. Keep your finances in your name. Keep them away from them. Um, you know, I've had counselors tell me that you know only. The person who is gambling only gets credit cards for like, uh, you know, gift cards. I mean, not credit cards, gift cards for gas and food. And that's it. No cash, no credit cards, nothing else. Um, you can start there. Those are some good points. But uh, reaching out, asking for help. Um, I know in Oregon, we have amazing treatment. We have it's free in Oregon. All of our treatment for gambling is free. Um, is it enough? No, but it's a start. Um, but so asking for help getting out there and, um, you know, either getting online help, it's through text, it's inpatient if you need it. We have those things available. And so Gamblers Anonymous, um, lots of different ways to reach out and get that help. And the person that, again, the family members also need to get that help and support. There's support for us too. Um, and I wish we would have done it because I think we may have had a different outcome if we would have known better how to communicate with it and um, how to start that conversation. If someone, which I imagine they are, is inspired by what they've heard today, 
where can they go to find out more about you and the initiatives that you're putting on? Um, so I have a website. It's ogao.org. Stands for Oregonians for Gambling Awareness Organization. Um, dot org. You can find more information there. I chair our county um, committee here for problem gambling. It's called Gamma Aware Coalition of Wayne County. I am chairing for um, stop predatory gambling and work with the national coalition against gambling or gambling prevention. So lots of different ways to get that information, but um, I am always available to chat or email or text. Um, like I said, I take phone calls from all over the place and I'm always happy to to have a helping hand in that. Is there anything else that you want people to know? Is there one message that you'd like to leave people with as they go about the rest of their day? Our slogan has always been, no problem gambler stands alone. And I know that wording is outdated. I get it. It's from 1995. Um, but the message is twofold. If, if, even though Bobby made the decision to gamble, it's the rest of us that have that ripple um, that has continued for almost 30 years. Um, it still affects me, which affected my children, which now affect my grandchildren. So those ripples that are left behind, um, but it's not just him that was affected by this. He made a choice um, to gamble and he ended his life. I wouldn't say that was his choice, but it happened. Um, and those ripples go on. The other side of that is no problem gambler stands alone it means there's people here who want to support you. You might be very surprised by the people around you being willing to love you and talk to you and help you through this. Are there going to be bumps in the road? Absolutely. Is it hard to step up and say, I've done these things to you, but I still love you? Yes, it is. Do I think that Bobby stopped loving us because of his addiction? Absolutely not. And we certainly have not stopped loving him. So give your family that choice. Give them that opportunity to support you in this decision and know that if there's bumps in the road, those are just bumps in the road and you can continue. I don't want anyone to, to think that suicide is the way out from this addiction. So stay strong and know that you're loved and you're cared about and you're worthy. Rhonda, thank you so much. And to everyone watching, let's keep getting better together one day at a time.